Welcome to the ATP Project. You're with your host Matt and Jeff. Elizma, good to have you today. Yeah, good to be here, We're Jeff. Going to be first time that we've been doing one together, so it's been overdue. I've been really looking forward to working with you. The um, as opposed to some <laughs> <laughs> juveniles that we have. Uh, no, Matt, Matt's all right. But today we're going to be talking about caffeine and all stimulants. Uh, so let's go for it. That's right. <laughs> let's go for it. Oh, so cool. in terms of, I mean, obviously we, we talk about caffeine and people are thinking about their coffee and their pre-workouts, but there's a whole host of, uh, you know, other uppers if you like, but I'm going to hand over to you smart people and let's start talking about caffeine. Where do you want to go? Yeah, well, basically... Um, there's lots of different forms of caffeine and there's, well, not really. I mean, we're talking about methyl xanthine, but it's found in a lot of different plants and that sort of stuff. So, and each plant has got a different combination of caffeine and caffeine derivatives along with other polyphenolic compounds or other compounds that might be in it that change the way it behaves, you know, like... Yeah, some people, they'll say, I can't drink a coffee, but they can drink green tea. You know, they get too much of a buzz from coffee, but green tea's fine, even if it's got the same level of caffeine. Mm -hmm. um, just different compounds make the um, caffeine aspect of the coffee work differently. There's also a bit of debate around, is it a diuretic? How much impact does it have on the adrenals? Um, we hear that it's the most well-studied and proven ergogenic aid when it comes to sport. <laughs> um, but, but we've got... We've got um or the ability now to actually be able to determine all of this stuff and how many papers are there out on individual ingredients Tons. that prove well, this the, is, the effectiveness so right? this is a summary this is rick Kreider's summary yeah. the exercise and sport nutrition bible so this is he, he's at the one of the heads of the issn which is the international society of sports nutrition but this is just a summary yeah this is a summary of the science and yeah. this is the stuff that made the book yeah. there's a whole chapters on the stuff that's been well studied and then medium levels of evidence and low level of evidence but sometimes you also got to understand that our understanding of how to explain the mechanism of action or the biochemistry behind how things work we not we don't always know that doesn't mean it doesn't work so sometimes i see these studies and go uh, like it does amazing things like turmeric is always a great example they go and show these studies it does these amazing things but hang on it's not bioavailable it can't possibly do that stuff let's throw it out unless we make it more bioavailable you know yeah. so and that's where <laughs> science gets weird so in regards to caffeine um we're not going to talk too much about all of the stimulants mm -hmm. because caffeine is such a big topic by itself okay um and there's so many different forms of caffeine and how they work and it's, it's so many cool little discussions that come from it because I mean, most of us out there either drink coffee or know someone that does, you know. So it's a very important topic. Yeah. It's, it's, it's <laughs> one of the world's most used drugs, right? I yes. Mean, when you think about yep. it, caffeine, I mean, you've got a coffee in front of you right I now. I do. I just had one before. Well, there we go. Don't we judge are, me. Our performance will be amazing. We'll be four, right. four, four seconds faster on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> that makes me so fast. Um, but let's yeah, okay, well, let's get into it. Caffeine. So, I mean... Yep. That was it. We've done it. Wow. No, no. So with caffeine, oh, that really hurt. There's a leg under the table there. Um, so was the one at the head of the table. That leg. That was a leg joke. You have to grow up in with the last name a leg to understand how these things happen. Now, <laughs> <laughs> so when we're looking at different forms of coffee, I mean, most people look at the coffee bean. Yeah, the cafe cafe. What are they? Arabica or Robusta? Um, yeah, it's a, that's the two main ones. They're I think the main ones. Studied, but yeah. Most of the ones in America we get are the Robusta. Um, mm. and that's, I think they're the South American sort of style that comes from. And then the Arabica is that the one see. that we get from the European style coffees. That's the ones we have more. Yep. Yeah. So, um, but either way, they <laughs> contain the same methyl xanthine. And I'm going to call caffeine like methyl xanthine because the cool thing is, is when it's a xanthine molecule with a methyl group, it can cross the blood brain barrier. And when it crosses the blood brain barrier, it can activate the central nervous system, and that's where you get the central nervous system stimulation. Um, and it inhibits these enzyme, uh, these receptors called adenosine. So adenosine is an off switch on your nerves, and it inhibits that off switch. So that allows you to, to run for faster, mm. basically. It has other effects as these blocking these phosphodiesterase enzyme, and phosphodiesterase breaks down a compound that builds up inside our cells that works like an on switch so we build up cyclic amp when mm -hmm. we're running things faster and when things are active and doing stuff they use cyclic amp and then the body uses these enzymes called phosphodiesterase to clear that cyclic amp away and allow things to relax or it'll activate an adenosine receptor and allow it to switch off well coffee blocks both of those so it keeps your your on switch on yeah. for longer and also blocks the handbrake 
So that allows you to have that stimulation that you feel from coffee. And that's what I'm talking about mainly. Initially, the methylxanthines in the brain. <clears throat> that's what you feel first. And that's why we think coffee wakes us up. The, the, just a quick question on cyclic AMP then. Mm. So, I mean, I thought that that was beneficial for fat loss. Mm. And I know that caffeine's beneficial for fat yeah. loss. So if it blocks yeah. it, then how does it actually help with fat loss? No, it blocks phosphodiesterase. So good question, Jeff. Um, cyclic AMP drives... So you know how thyroid hormones stimulate metabolism? Mm -hmm. They do it by activating cyclic AMP in all these different cells of the body. So cyclic AMP is an on switch and it makes things run faster and it makes you burn more fat. Right. Activates AMP Ks and all that sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah. It's like a second messenger. So so, yeah. yeah, it just stimulates calcium release and a whole bunch of other things. Yeah, yeah so when, you know, you get like adrenaline receptors and thyroid receptors, we get all this stimulation on the outside of the cells that says, hey, run, stress, we've had drugs, stimulation and that sort of stuff. Yep. Then behind that receptor, the second messages kick in, it's this thing called either cyclic AMP is an on switch, cyclic GMP is kind of the off switch. Mm -hmm. So then what happens is if you keep getting stimulation, that cyclic AMP builds up. And we've got these enzymes inside that clear it away. They clear away the cyclic AMP and get rid of it. So caffeine inhibits the enzymes that clear away the cyclic AMP and thereby it preserves oh, right. cyclic AMP in the cells. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah it's cool. So right? that keeps them running faster. And yeah. again, hence fat loss. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So stimulants, um, foscolin is a compound in colleagues yeah. that's famous for directly activating cyclic AMP. Yep. Um, so those sort of things will stimulate cyclic... They talk about beta receptors... Uh, uh, um, when I talk about stimulants and, the, and adrenaline and those sort of things, they all drive that same process and thyroid hormones drive that same process and they all build up cyclic AMP and then these phosphodiesterases clear it away. But phosphodiesterases do all sorts of stuff all over the body and we yeah. will talk about a lot of different types. Um, so what happens when we have coffee? The methylxanthines come in <clears throat> at different rates depending on what, where the where it comes from and I'll, I'll run through some of those because it's kind of a really cool strategy that you can play around with there so you get this big surge of the methylxanthines it wakes you up if you're responsive to that mm -hmm. so we'll talk about coffee non-responders as well mm. yeah. um, wakes you up and then your body demethylates the caffeine all right and that removes the methyl group off it that then creates other compounds out of it theobromine wow. which we'll talk Chocolate. about so that yeah theobromine's famous in cacao and other forms, chocolate's also in yerba mate. So theobromine is one of the demethylated forms of caffeine. Yeah. Theophylline is another mm -hmm. one, which we often see in supplements, and it's famous for asthma treatments and that sort of stuff. Yep. Um, <laughs> and then a paraxanthine. Um, so they're the ones that go through and have all the body effects. So mm -hmm. you realise that there's a the methylxanthine hits you in the head, yep. wakes you up, and then it gets broken down to all these other derivatives, and they float around your body, having a lot of other effects of caffeine over a longer period of time. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because the paraxanthine, I mean, has got a lot lot longer sh um, half life than than xanthines like or sorry methyl xanthines like um like caffeine so caffeine has about a half-life of three to four hours yeah and then uh paraxanthine is a, is uh, can go for anywhere from six to ten hours wow so even though caffeine and they're both biologically active they both are adenosine, uh, adenosine receptor inhibitors so even though the caffeine is not there you still can have those um, metabolites floating around um that has exactly the same action um and so the interesting thing is that even before we get to like the metabolism of it you know, you were talking about the adenosine receptors, Matt. Now, it can actually bind to four different receptors. So one is the adenosine receptor, like you mentioned. Um, it can also bind to, um, I can never remember these names, um, the ionotropic glycine receptor. And glycine is obviously an inhibitor. You know, you can have taurine, beta alanine, and glycine binding to this receptor, and that calms you down. You know, it's, it calms the whole nervous system down. So caffeine can block that one as well, which is another way it can kind of stimulate the central nervous system. Uh, another one it can bind to is uh, uh, voltage-dependent uh, ry ryhanodine receptors. I've never heard of these, but it activates them, right? And so these receptors actually release, it stimulates that release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum and the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And by doing that, it actually stimulates ATP production in the heart and in the pancreas. So right. caffeine can you know, benefit that even. And then the fourth one it can bind to, or uh, where it is an antagonist, the same as adenosine, so it actually blocks this receptor, is the inositol triphosphate receptor. And so 
uh, IP3 or inositol triphosphate yeah. binds to this receptor, same thing, it stimulates the release of calcium, uh, which then is like a second messenger. And it's very important, this, this intracellular calcium release, because it's, it stimulates very important functions like cell growth and development. But if it's, if it's stimulated too much, like if you have too much calcium release, it can actually damage the uh, GABA neurons in the Purkinje fibers in the brain, right. um, which can then um, you know, put you at risk of things like uh, Huntington's disease and right. Alzheimer's disease. So that's where some of the you know, studies that I've seen on caffeine, is like it can be protective against these diseases, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'd say that's probably the mechanism. It stops this excessive release of calcium. Um, by blocking these kinds of channels. It's funny because a lot of uh, religions, I'm thinking of Mormon, for example, and and other, actually ban caffeine from their diet. And I was asking a friend of mine that was Mormon, and I said, oh, why is that? And he says, oh, well, we taught that it's also bad for the heart. But I mean, I'm looking mm. here as well too. So, you know, there seems to be some protective stuff, but yeah. some also some, some, some of the negative stuff. And again, we can get into adrenals as well too, which I know a lot of people would be going, oh, yeah. okay, what is the interaction with caffeine and adrenals? But mm. do you have any sort of understanding... On, on that? Yeah, so, um, you know, depending on, um, and so, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes, but I've got so many notes here and oh, I have the to The people on the podcast did not know. You just seriously dumped yourself <laughs> in there. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've given it all away. I'm not even wearing pants. <laughs> Don't worry. Well, so because it, when it binds to the adenosine receptors, right, then it, that triggers like a release of neurotransmitters such as your monoamines, which is like your norepinephrine and serotonin, and can also then trigger the release of acetylcholine. Now, norepinephrine Epinephrine and epinephrine, they can bind to the peripheral um, alpha and beta adrenergic receptors, and that's kind of how it stimulates or has like a stimulatory action. Uh-huh. It doesn't actually have um, a direct um, uh, direct action on the alpha and the beta adrenergic receptors. It's more through that norepinephrine, epinephrine stimulation, and then that binds. That's why caffeine is much milder than something like ephedrine, for instance, course, because yeah. ephedrine can directly bind to the alpha beta adrenergic receptors as well as stimulate epinephrine and uh, uh, norepinephrine. So it's like a double whammy. Mm-hmm. So that's why caffeine is not nearly as stimulating as something like ephedrine, for instance. Mm. Um, so that's kind of uh, one of the main mechanisms. I mean, uh, it also works by modulating dopamine release. So caffeine is involved in dopamine release and dopamine, dopamine receptor activity as well. Yep. So it can really accentuate those things, which is why it, it helps us with focus and concentration <coughs> and And dopamine's also energy. good for pride and reward, man. Is that the right yeah. one? Yes. And, yep. And, yep. And, yep. Yep. Appetite and suppression. That sort of stuff. Right. You know, so this is why you don't get hungry when you're taking like a lot of caffeine remember the old like ACE stack yeah I do or ECA stacks, ECA stacks. Or whatever, whatever. I was going to like, actually yeah. ask about that yeah because yeah. yeah. when Elizabeth just touched on it there so when you look at the ephedrine which was the E part yep. um, that hits these beta receptors has the adrenaline like effects mm-hmm. which increases all those second messages including cyclo-KMP when you stack that with caffeine the caffeine inhibits those phosphodiesterase enzymes that clear that away so, so they have a the synergistic effect yeah, so you right. get one driving the receptor activation the other one preserving the chemicals that are made from that to actually prolong it yeah. I don't know why the aspirin bit was in there actually I, the, the, <coughs> we know aspirin's blood thinner I can't remember well, the funny thing is, is that when I was selling sports supplements got into it in the early 2000s but all through the 80s and 90s the gold standard of fat burners was the ECA stack yeah, well, obviously remember. then they came and they banned ephedrine um, yeah. Yeah. I think in most countries Australia uh, US that was weird well, though too man because you know that you know when they banned ephedra the herb ephedra Ma Wang had been ah, used yeah. for a long was, time yeah. yes. very different as like pseudoephedrine but <clears throat> they some of the case studies they used to ban ephedra one of them was a baseball player that was doing a pre season trying to cut all this weight apparently to protect the reputation of everyone involved they decide to blame the herb rather than the other stuff that was in the system two tracksuits there was one guy a hot day oh wow yeah, yeah. and there's one cooked. yeah and there's yeah. one other case where it was actually they died in a head-on crash but the guy oh, had ephedra good. in his system so they blamed ephedra <laughs> another guy Best just a, another side effect associated with another guy that died with ephedra had a shotgun hole in his chest yeah that might have caused so that, that, <laughs> that yeah, but it. It was still it. another ephedra fatality I think that I th- add to the stats. It's like messed up. And the only reason why I mention that is because 
probably two or three years ago, um, I went to a conference in America and it was one of the main lawyers that was involved in the ephedra, trying to defend ephedra f- and, and had no luck there. And he was saying, watch out, caffeine's going to be next. Mm. He said they're creating all of these dialogue oh. and stories around yes. what is an acceptable level of caffeine, what's safe, what's effective and what will kill you. And they talk about those heart and all that sort of stuff. And it's... Mm. And he said, you know, they're they're creating the same dialogue. Just be aware that it's going to get regulated and possibly... um, But then the pyramid diet is okay because that's going to make you perform really well, eating all that sugar and grains and stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's It's frustrating. (coughs) But in terms of (coughs) caffeine, I I can't... Like alcohol or cigarettes. I mean, cigarettes are known to be a carcinogen, right? Yeah. But there was such a strong demand for it. I think what they probably... uh, They'll never ban it, but what they might do is might tax it out the wazoo. It might might cause an opportunity to... But then they'll ban caffeine. Yeah. You're right, so... Well, Well, the good thing... do you think that they would ban it? I mean, oh, I, I mean, I with coffee, not. I think you'd literally have global riots well, if you yeah, banned caffeine. Well, definitely not the coffee. Definitely not, not let the, the natural. The so, oh, oh, you're I'm talking straight pure yeah, caffeine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Caffeine supplements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's wild, eh? Mm. When you look at pure caffeine, it's like when you get it and you put it under the. I got photos somewhere. I'll supply that. It's spins you. I don't know if I got too much in my system or something that particular day. But when you're in there, the light goes through it. It like che- keeps changing colours. It's oh, like really? it's a blue or a green, depending on what your environmental light is. It's wild stuff, wow. like weird ass crystal powder. Um, and that's the really pure, pure stuff. Um, in most of these plants that we're looking at, naturally, they're, mm. they're sitting at about 0.5, maybe up to about 1.5% caffeine is yeah. a typical number. Sometimes you'll see people that can consistently make a 10% caffeine and that's usually spiked with anhydrous caffeines or some other form of caffeine that they've added into it um, just to get a consistent dose and make it easier for people to work out when they're formulating. But in natural forms, you'll get a certain amount of natural variation. And I just want <clears throat> to list off some of the cool natural forms. Did you want to say something first? No, no actually, thing? I think you're no. going there. I was, yeah. I was going to ask in book market, yeah. mm. is, is, is natural with all the alkaloids and all the other things versus pure caffeine? Because yes. I'm fascinated by that. So it's very, very different in the way they behave in the body. The yeah. funny thing is, is the half-life and the, uh, the pharmacokinetics <coughs> and the certain aspects of the pharmacology, they, they look the same. For example... Um, when you, I've got a chart here that I made up and I'll try to make it into something that other people can read as well and we can share that with people. But basically when you looked at it, natural coffee from just roasted coffee beans, um, that was absorbed actually the fastest because it's water soluble and that sort of stuff. It got absorbed within about half an hour. So natural caffeine, water soluble just hits you pretty fast, which is why you can have a coffee and within half an hour you're pretty well away. It'll peak at about half an hour, 30 minutes after you eat it. The green coffee beans, because they got more of the polyphenols, more chlorogenic acids, more of these other bits and pieces that have beneficial effects within the body, um, and typically a fibrous phytate sort of compounds. That one's slightly slower. Um, the green coffee sits at about 45 minutes. It takes about 45 minutes to come in. Interestingly, synthetic and hydrous caffeine, it's close to 40 minutes as well. So really? the synthetic one gets absorbed just as quickly, but it doesn't hang around as long. It tends to crash a fair bit faster. Mm. And um, um, for, I'm not sure exactly why. I'd need to look into more of that. Um, the, um, the, the green coffee oh, – so sorry, the theobromine um, is an interesting one because what you'll see actually happening is as you are breaking down – the coffee, it converts to theobromine. Yeah. Mm. So the coffee comes in as a methyl xanthine, it has that stimulation effect, and then it's broken down into things like theophylline and theobromine. So they've got this slow drop, and that's how you get this long lasting effect in the body um, from coffee. Mm. Um, with the yerba mate, <coughs> yerba mate, where's that on my little cool list? So yerba mate, oh, that was coming, sorry, yerba mate was the first one coming in really quickly. Um, and what you'll find happening is the as the coffee comes up it's starting to drop with the brain effects and some people then can crash so with the synthetic and hydrous ones it comes up so fast or it comes up the same as fast as everyone else but because it drops much faster then people get that crash and they need to have more or they're not feeling that effects of it they don't get the body effects from it that you'd get from the natural ones as much as you just get this initial hit in the brain and then it wears out really quickly so a lot of the times when people formulate supplements or when you buy like caffeine pills and that sort of stuff they're these purified isolated synthetic caffeines mm. that are dosed up um you know aiming at around the 200 milligram or whatever is the legal limit these days yeah um 
So that comes up pretty fast, but drops fast. So you just get these up and down all the time, and then you need to keep going back for more coffee. The more processed it is, you know, the instantized coffee and that sort of stuff, when you're not getting a lot of those dirt and roughage and that from your coffee you know like when you brew it all up it's it's like you're getting all sorts of yeah. stuff coming through it yeah. you know? the of the but you get this little instantized yeah. coffee it's pretty much so purified and um uh, processed that it gets absorbed and it's so soluble and it just gets absorbed very quickly it doesn't have a lot of those other benefits and then it disappears right um but when you have it from proper herbs and that sort of stuff like you have a mate's other green coffee beans and that sort of stuff you get that nicer more round effect and you get full body effects rather than yeah. just bang central nervous system stimulation yeah um what's interesting about it is there's some other cool compounds that work well with it so and what you're looking for is the synergy that nature can provide so like other if you have a look at a compound like a stimulant compound like synephrine and you talked about um, we talked about epinephrine as the natural compound in our body you talked about pseudoephedrines and ephedrines and that sort of stuff well synephrine or cinephrine, that's a compound that comes out of um, citrus peels. Mm -hmm. There are lots of different ones, but citrus orantium is the most famous one for it, or bitter orange. Mm -hmm. That one there is a stimulant to the central nervous system. It hits those beta receptors and that sort of stuff. But it's actually absorbed. It peaks at about an hour. So the funny thing is, is a lot of people put cinephrine into a pre-workout and go like, you're going to have it and then feel this buzz straight away. You don't. It takes an hour for that sort of cinephrine buzz to start to feel. But then it enhances the effects of the caffeine. Yeah. It, it, drives, yeah. it drives those first receptors to stimulate the cyclic AMP and right. it drives those processes and the coffee's then starting to build up these phosphodiesterase inhibition, um, which preserves that cyclic AMP. So when you stack a cinephrine, which is a, a stimulant on that aspect, um, with something like a coffee that actually enhances its effect, you get more synergistic action. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a lot of other stimulants out there that don't work synergistically with coffee. So the old mm. old uh, 70s and 80s diets was uh, uh, black coffee with grapefruit in the morning. I there mean, you go. Yeah, you that's it right. Up. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It's interesting. I'm fascinated by grapefruit. In this yeah. I've got a tree covered in them. I Do can't you? stand them. I love stuff, grapefruit. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually too. craving them at the moment. And I, I was sitting there the other day. There's got to be something you got to do is mow my lawn and help yourself to the grapefruit. I've got to have grapefruit. What? Anyway, maybe we could do one on grapefruit. We will do that. There's something I'll add to the to the cinephrine now that you're kind of talking about it, Matt, is because yeah. um, you're absolutely right in that, you know, that combined with the caffeine is a really good combination because the caffeine gives you, uh, the cinephrine is not as stimulating as, as, as the caffeine is. Mm. Um, and one of the, um, one of the reasons is apparently it's because of where um, its hydroxyl group sits. So you, if you look at cinephrine, ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, they're actually structurally quite similar with um, some differences that um, uh, that they work slightly differently. For instance, ephedrine and, and pseudoephedrine doesn't have any hydroxyl groups, uh, whereas cinephrine has the hydroxyl group on what they call the um, para position of uh, the benzene ring. Now, why that is important is because that is the position of where this hydroxyl group sits, it actually doesn't have that stimulating cardiovascular stuff so that's yeah. why you don't get the heart palpitations or the the vaso you know the high blood pressure or any of that kind of stuff even though it's a stimulant still you know central central nervous system stimulant you don't get the cardiovascular effects of it right. yeah. and i think well just because of that position i'm um, you know it would yeah. be interesting to know why it has that yeah, specific absolutely. action but it just shows because there's multiple s safety studies on using uh, cinephrine with caffeine right yep. and in fairly large doses too well up to 100 um, milligrams yeah <clears throat> they've even got some of the better studies on synephrine and caffeine combined is um 100 milligrams synephrine 100 milligrams of caffeine yeah um, yeah and in those papers they could show i tell you what was really interesting about those papers and i don't understand how this happens yet um but it actually shut down carbohydrate oxidation as a source of fuel and significantly increase fatty acid oxidation as a source of fuel when you stack those mm. two things together, which was really weird because a lot of the other studies you look at at caffeine, yeah, it improves met metabolic rate, um, again, through the cyclic AMPs and that sort of stuff, but it also increases fatty acid oxidation. But they'll talk about always with submaximal exercise. So you get into that normal fat burning zone. Mm. So if you're exercising, you're in your normal fat burning zone, which yep. is wherever it is with your heart rate. So you're talking about like whatever steady state cardio? Yeah, yeah. So when you're doing your steady state cardio, a lot of these are like endurance, not endurance, but they're like 
riding and walking and yep. those sort of studies or jogging and that sort of stuff and then they burn what you're using as your fuel mm-hmm. so when not and not so what i'm saying is not at peak exercise right and when you when you're at that sub maximal level and you're just doing some steady state stuff caffeine increases fatty acid oxidation as a favorable fuel source wow. over other forms of carbohydrates That's that really may be cool. available yeah. and that was enhanced again by stacking it with synephrine wow um now i thought that was really kind of that cool because cool. the yeah. studies and it's quite interesting because i've got all the studies here we can share people but the, the actual carbohydrate utilization actually dropped um and as the fat went up it was quite interesting it just did this shift which is kind of cool because they all activate amp k's and that sort of stuff as well which we talk about but normally we only talk about those things in regards to calorie surplus or calorie deficiency but in these instances these people were just walking it wasn't talking about calories it was just yeah. by saying walking with the caffeine actually made you burn a bit well, more it's, fat it's really funny because again this is where you talk to different professionals bodybuilders or people that are trying to lose weight mm. and some absolutely swear by hit and others hate hit and they only like steady state and some do a combination of both and yeah. a lot of it comes down to what you respond to but exactly. it could be and what, what you you're do consuming consistently yeah, well exactly yeah. it could be what you're consuming as well too i mean some people might train fasted like nothing other people might have a oh. coffee or, or a fat burner before they well, go train. another just what you're talking about that because this is interesting for some people out there might be thinking yeah well coffee does nothing for me you judge that by how your mental arousal so when someone says oh coffee doesn't do it, yeah. i could have a coffee and go to sleep yeah. You know, yeah. so what they, and they call themselves a non responder. They don't actually, but a scientist might say you're a non responder. Mm-hmm. You're not allowed in my study. I'm mm-hmm. going to pick the people that get the great results. Yeah. No. Um, yeah, so they when they talk about a non responder, it means the people that don't get the energetic arousal from coffee. Um, but there's an interesting study that shows even the non responders get the same ergogenic benefits from coffee. Oh, so right. well, the people that get the methyls so what i'm saying is that the 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 effects that you get from caffeine uh-huh. um is not just from central nervous system stimulation firing yeah. you up to go to you know like it's not just motivation and drive yep. it's actually these systemic effects on the adenosine and these other receptors and the phosphodiesterase enzymes that mm-hmm. has all the effect mm-hmm. and this is why i love natural stuff because if you have a look at natural stuff versus something that's designed to hit you in the head and wake you up yeah. quickly, yeah. it doesn't necessarily have any of those body benefits that you'd get by using a natural form. Yeah. Like if you have like yerba mate, I love yerba mate, uh, glucagon like peptide, it, it's very important. It's stimulating that to control satieties and appetites and that sort of stuff. Very amazing mod biotic at changing around your gut uh, ratios. <clears throat> to suit sport and um, even in calorie restriction prevent starvation and that that's where it's really quite famous there directly activates amp k it increases the thermic effects of your foods so what that means is if you take a yerba mate around your meals and that sort of stuff it's going to reduce your appetite but it's also going to increase how much thermogenesis you get just from that meal mm. so and for perspective when you have a look at a daily calorie burn, and something zero to nine percent of your calories are exercise, um, up to forty percent of your calories can be the thermic effects of food. Mm. So it can have oh, that yeah. massive effect. Yeah. So if you can have something there that can say, "Yeah, all right, I'll have it before exercise," it might encourage my fat burning when I go for my walk. That's sweet. But the fact that you could have it away from exercise with your meals does all these great things for your gut and stimulates the hepatothermic or the way your liver will process through things after the meal and how much calorie burn you get from eating is what i'm talking about and yeah they say that's why protein's good because it you know post yeah. or thermogenesis yeah. or yeah. fats or, so there's a lot of that but it doesn't matter really what dietary strategy you're doing if you stack it with some of these sort of things you might be able to improve your metabolic rate after yeah. that meal you know right. <clears throat> well, you touched on something interesting matt is about the non-responders so people who are very sensitive to caffeine and those who like you said can have coffee and they can go to bed so i mean there can be various reasons for that but um, if we look at how caffeine is metabolized, now even the metabolites is metabolized. So first, everything starts mainly with the CYP182 uh, enzyme. Mm. Um, so then they get metabolized into, uh, and also the CYP2E1, I should say, as well. So all of these drug I'm glad you mentioned that one, because Jeff was sitting there going, I can't believe oh, she had mentioned that. She's <laughs> gotten the 2A11. <laughs> yeah. that, that's right. Yeah. Um, and I think the CYP304 is in there somewhere as well. But anyway. We've just got phase one. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's the phase one liver detoxification. Yeah. So about 80, 84%, I think, of caffeine is metabolized into paraxanthine, and then I think 12% to theophile, um, is it... Um, See, I can never remember. Theobromine. You said it. Theobromine Theophylline or Theophylline. And then, Theophylline. And then Theobromine, yeah. I think, yeah. is, a, is a little bit smaller. But as we talked about, that paraxanthin, these metabolites are yeah. just the same biologically act, 
activity as caffeine, right? Yep. So you'll still feel stimulated. So the next step is through acetylation, and that's through the N-acetyltransferase enzyme in phase two liver detoxification, or NAT2. And that acetylation process then breaks down paraxanthine, um, you know, into into nothing. So I'd say, you know, from looking at some of the research, the people who who struggle with um, caffeine, like let's say they get very overstimulated, they get a lot of the cardiovascular effects, um, they would probably have problems with the NAT2 and the, and the CYP1A2 enzyme, right? So they'll just very slow, they metabolize it just way too slowly. Yeah, so they get it, so when, they, when they're drinking it, it first, first pass the metabolism, block. the liver's got an opportunity to convert it into something else and just throw it straight away. That's right. Or, yeah. or convert it to something else. And that's what we call the first pass metabolism and that's done with the cytochrome P450s, yeah. um, which we just mentioned there. Um, and so what you're saying is some people, that first phase is really slow. Yeah. Yes. And then, therefore, that coffee goes straight through the system and they get a bigger dose into their bloodstream and they're the hyper-responders. They're the ones that have the overreaction yeah. to coffee, yep. which is low cytochrome P450. Right. Yep. And the, the things that's interesting, if you look at you know, what can make that enzyme slow, what can make that phase one liver process <laughs> slow is estrogen. So birth control and pregnancy, and they found that with, in pregnancy in the third trimester, it can increase or it can slow down the... Uh, the, the metabolism of caffeine so much that it can increase the half-life of up to 56 hours. Oh so gosh. from three to four hours to 56 hours in the third trimester of pregnancy. Mm. So it's not going to be in, in all women, but that's, that's what estrogen can do. It's can, in, so in birth control, pregnancy, that's how much it can slow it down. I think there's some antidepressants like L- L- Luvox or something like yeah. that that can also slow it down. They slow down the cytochrome. Sl- slow down the cytochrome. So it makes caffeine hang around a lot longer yep. so you get the... You know the jitteriness, the anxiety, you know, and things like that. Maybe if if, yeah. if you're so on you're antidepressants, well, yeah. right? So one of our friends, she's like that. She can't take coffee, man. She is like on the next planet for, for days if she yeah. takes it. Mm. But so they often have that slow cytochrome P450s. So is that an indication of someone that doesn't eat enough protein, or is it is, some, is it an indication, or is it more? Are we talking about just genetic structure? Um, look, I'm not a big one yeah. on genetic structure yeah, when yeah, it comes yeah. to these. I think if you look at the nutrients needed for phase one, for all yeah. those CYP, you know, cytochrome 450 enzymes, yeah. if you look at the cofactors, it's iron, it's a big cofactor. Yeah. So iron. iron deficiency is going to affect how you yeah. know, how you metabolize things in your liver. Wow. With an iron deficiency, um, your HPA axis is already up that's because right. it thinks you're bleeding to death or something. That's right. Yeah. You need iron to make the dopamine and epinephrine and norepinephrine. So yeah. sometimes I find that all these complex things is as simple as an iron deficiency yeah right? yeah how common um, is iron deficiency oh really oh yeah. almost every child i test has yeah. got some kind of iron deficiency why what, yeah. what, what what are we doing different well for kids first of all they do use a lot of iron because they they're in a growth state right um so mm. maybe that's just they just use it up a lot but then it's a lot of kids eat. who don't you need a lot of acid to eat. You need that's to right sit down to eat like and to process eat the meat. food and yeah yeah i don't know about your kids matt but from you know, I mean, one of my one boys hate yeah well that's it have you noticed every time someone writes a book on a kid, it's like one kid. Yeah. And then they have another one and go, oh, throw that book away. That's right. Um, and they, but there's already a famous writer, so they and, don't and, tell And us so that. to, to yeah. cover up on that deficiency outside of red meat, what else can you eat that's got good uh, bioavailable iron? Oh, red meat is pretty much your that's best, the best bioavailable, one yeah. The problem is, because we're talking about bioavailable iron, um, one of the things that reduces the availability of iron is phytates mm. right. and oxalates and that sort of stuff, but mainly phytic acid, and you find that in the in the plants. So you have a look at it, things like spinach was great, not as great as they said with the Popeye, because there was a spelling mistake in that. Did you ever hear that Popeye story? No. And then they said, Popeye, you've got to eat your spinach because it's full of iron. Arr. It was all based on this one study, but the scientist actually put the decimal point in the wrong place um, it actually, he says, he tried to tell him it's 10%, you know, it's like actually one tenth of what you were saying it is. I made oh, a mistake wow. in my paper, but by then they did <laughs> to, a big campaign to say, like eat your spinach and make it strong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh. And he couldn't ever pull it back. It was like one of those things where you accidentally mistake, it just kept going. I and love going. it, that, that pre war sort of stuff. Was it Popeye, uh, eat your spinach and then olive oil? Yeah, yes, it's just crazy. That's right, yeah. Cover it in olive oil. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, so um, what were we talking about? Well, we're talking about you know have to optimize these oh. enzymes and things like that. So if you if you have all the cofactors, you know, then yeah. you'll process caffeine quite well. What about um, you know we talk a lot about methylation. Well, everyone talks about methylation mm. these days. So we're talking about methylxanthine, a methylated form of caffeine. 
is what you find in nature. But then it gets demethylated, and the people that demethylate it really well are the ones that don't experience a lot of the buzz. And there's also some data saying when we build up resistance to caffeine, it's actually our ability to demethylate. Now, um, what's interesting about that is, you know how um, we talked about the first phase of uh, detoxification. Mm, yes. A lot of people, um, you know, when they talk about needing to do a detox or to... Yeah, you know, my liver. I need to do a liver detox. A lot of toxins and that sort of stuff, and which caffeine is um, detoxified as if it's a toxin. What they do is because we just mentioned the cytochrome P four fifties are needed for that phase one to convert it in from a, a, a form that is actually can go to your brain and cause all these problems into a form that's easier for your body to eliminate. Yeah, you know, it's a part of the first pass of metabolism to protect you and from these sort of potential toxins. Um, so what happens is when you drink lots of coffee and you drink it over and over and over again, your actual cytochrome P four fifties go faster and faster and faster. Mm. So what happens is you actually speed it up. You train your liver. Now Elizabeth made the, the comment that she and put too much weight into genetic structure with these things because genetic expression and how yeah. our body adapts to our environment is more important. Mm -hmm. So you might, you can drive your cytochrome P450s to go faster and faster if you've got the nutrients to support it and you're having exposure to the toxin. The only way to slow down those cytochrome P450s again is to actually take a break from the toxins. But usually it's part of a survival mechanism, so they stay going fast. So then you've got to go back and slow the things down. Yeah. Now, what do we slow them down with, you're asking, Jeff? Typically antioxidants. So the things that slow it down is things like green tea, the actual antioxidant, EGCG in the green tea. If Steve here would say epigallic and catechangalate wow. um, for the EGCG. Um, so that slows down the cytochrome P450s, but so does a lot of the other antioxidant, chlorogenic acids, a lot of the other compounds that are found in the herbal teas or the, the, the natural forms and the green coffees and that sort of stuff will actually stop that cytochrome P450 system from getting out of control. Nature yeah. knows um, best, always. Yeah. Yeah. And this yeah. is the thing, Absolutely. isn't it? It always provides the the what you need yeah. and then yeah. and then to take it away and this is what but we they're said all before. different too so you've got to learn your poison what works yeah. for you yeah. Yeah. so like um like guarana for example so yerba mate i love it it almost tastes like a herbal tea it's almost like a minty green yerba tea mate. and yeah. i want to, my mate marcus juliano i don't know i just follow we just chat on instagram and stuff he's my little brazilian friend that he's not that little actually i don't know why i said that but we're just little friends, I guess. Um, he, he has that that he has that little yerba mate pipe thing, and he walks. I always catch him in the trade shows and grab him and that. But he's got the little pot uh, full of the the yerba mate leaves in the hot water, and they got this weird ass straw, straw yeah. with a uh, the siphons out the chunks, you know. And they just sit there and suck on that all day, and it's really really good for you. It does a lot of those other appetite things. Garana, they brew it up like a like a cacao, like a hot cacao, um, hot chocolate that was, not right. a hot cow. Um, anyway, um, so guarana, <laughs> it's got a lot of other totally ben uh, different effects again. So where the yerba mate has got all these nice herby sort of effects into the gut as a, green, as a leafy herb and that sort of stuff, the guarana has got more effects on the insulin. Um, there's a lot of data Positive on guarana. Negative. No good, improves insulin sensitivity, reduces wow. insulin resistance, activates uncoupling proteins, AMPK, a lot of these mechanisms for fat burning. Wow. It's really well absorbed through the skin. In fact, there was a study um, oh, yeah. comparing trans dermal caffeine versus transdermal caffeine in guarana and the guarana one was absorbed better and worked better and then if you consider that guarana then also affects adipokines which are the chemicals released from the subcutaneous fat cells that contribute to things like insulin resistance and contribute to the puffiness in um, cellulite and that sort of stuff it's a wicked product and it also i don't know how to say it it's a brightening of cells yeah, it's yeah. like um, because it but it makes it more beige yeah, they call it brightening, but it's beigering. The white fat cells um, versus the brown. So yeah, yeah it right, helps to yeah. turn white fat into brown fat by making it. And they, but, so someone combined brown, the word brown and the word white, and called it bright. B R I T E. No. Oh. And and it's I would have called it referring. I would have called it brown. anything other than that because it's bugs brown. me when I take something that's nice and white into a browning <laughs> color and it's brightening yeah. it. It's like no, it's but it's darkening it. That's right. But it's annoying me anyway. That's little stuff like that I just but, can't but, let go. But bright was easier to say than round. Yeah, but why Brout. bright? Like <laughs> brown and white. Like wow. white. Anyway, so wow. some people call it beige. Anyway, so that's it's why like, It's like a, good. a poobadour and a labradoodle. I, I like poobadour way better than a labradoodle. But do you know how you get that? <laughs> what? I just missed all that. You know, they, they crossed a labrador with a poodle and they called it a, a labradoodle. I would have called it a poobadour. 
Anyway. Really? Yeah. Anyway, potato, potato. <laughs> Does it look For our American friends, Does it look tomato, at the wall sex? tomato, tomato. You're the only people that say tomato. It's no tomato. one says tomato. No, do Ameri- they? The, uh, 500 million people in the United States do. Yeah, really? They yeah. do. I call it aluminium. You call it aluminium. aluminium. Let's not have a controversy over how to say controversy. Okay. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right. Keep going. Just forget I said anything. All right. Done. What were you talking about, though? Well, I don't know what you were talking about. No, oh, you don't know what I was talking about. <laughs> no. Nobody well, understands what you said, she meant. <laughs> oh, no, I was up to my... I, was, I had a list. Um, yeah, and going. green coffee beans yep. is really cool. Um, they showed green coffee beans versus roasted coffee beans. Very similar with all those other effects, but had all these other benefits when it comes to enhancing the ability to use glucose again. So it talks about insulin sensitivity. It's got much higher polyphenols with the chlorogenic acid, um, which is the main one which you can research all the effects of chlorogenic acid. But what was really cool about the green coffee bean especially in extremely obese people the really obese people that you switched from the other coffee to green it really had a good effect on blood pressure mm. so it actually very powerful vasodilator maybe but when you have a look at these phosphodiesterase inhibition by re- inhibiting phosphodiesterase 5 i think it is you get the vasorelaxation so it opens up the blood vessels um, but we become resistant to nitric oxide if we get too much of that mm. and it's antioxidants that keep us sensitive to nitric oxide Hmm. So you see, just by having these extra antioxidants coming in through your teas with the coffee, you can actually prevent a lot of the long-term yeah. issues associated with coffee. But well, I don't know how many long-term issues there are with coffee. I haven't we, seen a huge amount of no, bad stuff. No, I haven't seen it. I mean, you have to literally, I think the toxic dose for um, caffeine is more than 10 grams. Yeah. Well, yeah. And you have to, and I mean, that's that's equivalent of 50 to 100 cups of coffee a yeah, day. Yeah. So that's toxic doses. That's a toxic <laughs> When I go to America and the, the yeah. amount of caffeine well, that you get in there, it feels right. like but, you're but getting you got it. Eight hundred milligrams. Of no, coffee. so but the, the cup of coffee is what seventy-five milligrams. Well, this, or, see, or this will depend on whether you buy it from McDonald's, Starbucks, or make it yourself. Right. Because yeah. they actually all have. It was very interesting. I actually, I mean, I've got it here. It's not that interesting, but they all had different levels of caffeine because I mean, if you've been to Starbucks in the states, I mean, it's huge for you know yeah. serving sizes. So you so actually. So what was the number that you said is toxic? More than 10 grams of wow. cancer. That's now, way more than yeah, what I thought. You it's think about more. it, man, because this is really... But we're really talking about dying, right? So yeah. we're talking right, right. 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams of caffeine will give you... Uh, they've got a they've got a name for it called caffeinism. So that's the that's when you get the heart palpitations. Right, and, and you're feeling bad. At what level? Sorry, bad. I was interrupting. Thousand to one thousand five hundred milligrams. Yeah, wow. right. So, so, so some of these coffees doses. in the states, I don't know what they are. I made it up when I said eight hundred, but some of them, I think Matt, you looked with no, four hundred no. milligrams. Or yeah, something? yeah. Some of them you're getting four and five. A venti, a, a, like a. The ventis that they were coming out of Starbucks were 500 milligrams yeah. of caffeine. Th- that's that's what I was buckets. looking. It's like yeah. you, you have huge, yeah. very, like a, a, you know, if you just made an instant cup of coffee mm. at home, you'd probably get something like like 90, 70, 70 90 milligrams of caffeine, maybe yeah. 120, depending mm. on the yeah. style of coffee. Yeah. But then you start looking at, um, you know, star, you know, sorry, Starbucks and McDonald's and all of that. But it's just the serving sizes, right? Sure. So that's more what mm. we're talking about. Yeah. Right? And so with the serving sizes, the caffeine content just increases Mega. dramatically. But you're still under that threshold. But the problem is, let's say if you went and had, a, 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 I don't know, an Aventi. I don't, why don't they just have small, medium and large and extra large? I know. It's just, right? I'll have you a, I'll have a, which one would you like? Uh, that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mine's like, regular massive. I don't know. Yeah. Hey. What were you going to say? Mysteries of the I've got something to say, and I'm going to forget it if I, I can't well, only have my pen on it for so you do long. It. You do it. So we had, we've had we recently in Australia had some changes to the regulation around caffeine. And when we're just talking about this now, now I'm so glad. It's, I mean, I was always glad that it happened. But you've got to understand how you just said the lethal dose, and we've recently mm. had someone die um, with pure caffeine. Yeah. Mm. You should not be able to access pure caffeine because okay. 200 milligrams, so 200, so if you think of a quarter of a teaspoon as 1,000 milligrams, all right? So 1,000 milligrams, quarter of a teaspoon. Yeah. So divide that, so one twentieth of a teaspoon is the amount of caffeine that would go into a serve of a pre-workout. Yeah. yeah. All right? Now, you, you would never do that. You can't, yeah. it's hard to measure that. Um, so when you have pure caffeine, like when we're talking about 1 to 1.5 grams, we're only talking about less than half a teaspoon. Talking about quarter mm. to half a teaspoon and you're you'll starting to get the palpitation unwell. effect. Yeah. If you have pure caffeine in your cupboard and, and the 10 grams is two teaspoons, we're looking about just 
two well, just heaps. Do, do we know? One teaspoon, probably. Do we know how much the gentleman? Died? I haven't read the no, coroner's report. I don't know. It's been released, I don't know. But, but it's I mean, like, I, I, there was a bit of innuendo and what have you. But you're right. I mean, the chances are, and I don't know what happened. Unless to that you've gentleman, got pure caffeine. But if you've got pure caffeine, hmm. and you and you and I heard, and I think this is wrong now. I think this is an urban myth that he mistook it for a glutamine to put it into his shake. Now, I, hmm. I believe that's actually wrong, but it doesn't matter. Doesn't you matter. can see how that could it happen. Could, it could yes. happen. It could let's say he was a slow. Let's say it had slow phase one and phase two liver metabolism. You know, there's there's all you know there's there's a lot of variables that can make someone, you know, even with the smaller dose like two grams or three grams, like you know, die. Yeah. Depending on all these other Especially variables. Especially if they've got an underlying heart condition. Yep. So yeah. and the other thing is doubling up. I mean, we just what I was going to say before as well too. So let's say if you go and have your large coffee from X company, mm. and then you go and take a pre workout as well too. That's right. And either it's not labelled properly, or you don't see it, and yeah. you take a, one of these mega pre workouts as well too. Yep. You know, you could be upwards over a thousand milligrams, and if yep. you've got an underlying issue, or you know, you say one of those types of responders, all of a sudden you've got health palpitations That's and right. potentially even worse. So, yeah. and, and as we say, the parazantin or the, the breakdown process of caffeine hangs around for up to ten hours. That's crazy. So, yeah. I mean, if you if you take a pre workout even three times a day, you know that caffeine from the morning is probably still hanging around around lunchtime. And the peripheral and nervous system stimulant. So the central yeah. nervous system stimulant yeah. hits you within the hour and then it's kind of weared out, worn off quickly. But peripherally, the effects are diuresis as well because, you know, they talk about coffee being a diuretic yes, and there's a bit yeah. of debate. Because yeah. you you'll see, I, I even saw some uh, really well-respected scientists just straight out arguing, you know, it's like flat earthers and then... Caffeine as a diuretic, you know, caffeine's not diuretic. No. Really? We're that crazy to suggest it. Wow. But the data, it's so what they're saying is methylxanthine's not a very powerful diuretic because methylxanthine works in the brain, but when it gets broken down into the other demethylated xanthines, that's where we get the, the diuresis and that's where we get the extra caffeine. And it does it by dilating the arteries into the kidneys, it stops the sodium from being reabsorbed, and those effects can be lasting for up to 8-10 hours, mm. along with other jitters and other body effects and that yeah. sort of thing. Because yeah, I think there's about about 98% of caffeine in the kidneys gets reabsorbed back into the system. So then you'll get that sodium exchange thing happening and, and all of yeah. that. So, so it does make you so weak. So people are taking caffeine for several reasons, being alert, themselves up especially feeling a bit tired or to kick yourself in the day whatever it may be uh, performance so in terms of mm-hmm. obviously as you said rowing you said before mm. and, and sprinting and, and, you power, know, and all that sort all of stuff, stuff. And, and fat loss what do we have an understanding I mean obviously everybody's composition and, and makeup is different but do we have an understanding of what's ideal to to hit that apex so point? I no. would I would probably it's, it's, mm. is it okay if I kind of jump Go on that yeah, yeah Thank absolutely you. better um, be exactly what I was thinking otherwise <laughs> we're going to edit it out but uh, uh, carry on <laughs> <laughs> well, for my suggestion is like what Matt has been kind of trying to say is that the plant forms are the better forms, right? Uh-huh. Because if you look at something, I'm just going to use, uh, well, if you, if you look at cacao and yerba mate, they both contain theobromine and caffeine. In different concentrations, like uh, theobromine is more caffeine, lower, lower uh, theobromine. Cacao is higher theobromine, lower caffeine. Be, be that as it may, I mean, if you look at caffeine itself, like we talked about earlier, blocks adenosine receptors, right? Theobromine doesn't, it modulates them, which means that with caffeine, you're gonna get a tolerance factor, which means it's not gonna work, you know, you're gonna have to take more and more and more kind of thing. With theobromine, you don't get that kind of uh, tolerance factor, and it's it's more of like what Matt was talking about, more like a, it's a more a sustained, kind of a, a better energy kind of a release. Mm-hmm. So if you do it from a plant-based form, you're gonna get the, the, the quick, um, you know, absorption and increase but also the more level and sustained kind of release and, and, and get the benefits like that instead of just taking something like pure caffeine so it's difficult to, depending to actually give a limit depending on obviously what source you're getting it for no. probably just it ranges from about 100 to 400 milligrams is where we get the ergogenic benefits without the side effects right when you start getting over 400 milligrams is when mm. you really start feeling the diuretic effects it's where you start getting changes to the heart rates and you get other sort of changes that might happen uh, th- systemically or starts to add that burden onto the liver ranging from about yeah 50 milligrams so you look at a normal cup of tea or coffee would be about 75 milligrams just a Mm -hmm. single shot Mm -hmm. made you know um not at those places with the giant cups yep um 
So those ones are about 75 milligrams. So the studies are should sound one, two, three, four of those a day. Yep. Um, is work per, 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 perfectly fine, safe, doesn't have any of those sort of long-term side effects or complications or any concern, and may even be beneficial for a variety of different effects with these antioxidant actions and that sort of stuff. And obviously we're saying that um, uh, a natural... Um, caffeine product like your yerba mate, your theobromines, mm. your green teas mm. are superior to just a straight pure synthetic caffeine because you've got all of those other cofactors yeah. with yeah. it as well too. So you could actually use less but get better results and then not get um, the, the the crash, the pump yep. and dump yeah. as I call well, it, and it, also the adrenals. adrenals. Yeah, so well, I was coming in into the adrenals. Yeah, yeah, so in regards to the adrenals, what, what we've discovered with the caffeine stimulation of cortisol, you know, so we talk about cortisol being catabolic and Cortisol's, you know, got Evil. positive yeah. and negative. Oh, yeah. no, it's got some no, no, great no, but, things. Uh, but it, yeah, yeah, typically we'll talk about it being bad because of the word catabolic, you yeah. know. Um, there's a lot of interesting d- discussion around cortisol in itself. But the way caffeine initiates cortisol is via the methyl form of caffeine, which goes via the blood-brain barrier and stimulates the release of ACTH from the pituitary gland, which then tells the adrenal glands to run and release cortisol. So what they've found is in people that are predisposed to a hyperreactive ACTH release, um, such as people with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, people that are predisposed to panic attacks, they just cop it so much worse. Um, also those people that actually are detoxifying the product quickly don't get anywhere as much cortisol you can become resistant to its central nervous Mm. system effects so what happens is you might if you don't touch coffee hardly ever and then you have one you'll get a much bigger effect and if you have it regularly you'll reduce it tell you one exemption to that that i come across was pre-puberty so when you expose people pre-puberty to caffeine, they become hyper-reactive and they actually create a lot of aggression and behaviour problems through puberty. So priming your children with caffeine um, prior to puberty and that sort of stuff uh, somehow allows them to keep responding badly to caffeine in the future oh, rather than becoming more resistant or tolerant to it. Yeah. So I need to know a little bit about that. But don't give your kids coffee. Well, I've got to say really quickly. No one give my kids coffee. At our, at our yeah. health, health summit, yeah. We were there and we we're obviously talking about Elizabeth, oh, you were yeah. there. And I saw this little girl and she was sucking down coffees. And I'm like, oh, I yeah. just thought oh, she had a yeah. coffee cup, maybe she had some water or something. Yeah. No. She, no. Down, she, she yeah. must have been like 11. Or I know. I was swearing I'm just like going, a trooper too, wow. this little kid. But she was drinking coffee, man. Seriously, I can swear yeah. in front of a kid drinking coffee. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I can heckle even. So, um, okay, then in terms of um, mm-hmm. the adrenal uh, impact, because I know that that's a big one as well too, and you sort of covered off on that, the protection mechanism then is your antioxidants so and, and circadian rhythms as well too I just want to bring that in because I mean we've done podcasts before talking about the importance of quality of sleep mm. and how obviously caffeine yeah. has a half-life so yeah, yeah. Y- again in terms of utilizing and, and we've seen people using products almost like uppers and downers mm. so they might use yeah. the caffeine in the morning and then use a, a, a GABA product or an antioxidant in the yeah. evening then to to force their body down uh, you know any any concerns or comments on that well the, the derivatives that loiter around so this is when you you know when you get like you're seriously tired you're falling asleep in front of the tv as soon as your brain gets enough of the chemicals in there to release and slow down you think no i can go to sleep but you know when your body's an idiot and it just wants to jump it wants to move you've got to get up and wee all night you might break out into a sweat all night and that sort of stuff yeah. they're the some of the things so it depends on the rate the battle between uppers and downers and the central nervous system is whether you can crash but your quality of sleep and your ability to stay asleep and sleep maintenance is often affected by how much of these derivatives of the caffeine is still floating around your body, yeah, the theophylines yeah. and theobromines and all that sort of stuff. It could even be, you know, I don't know if, if, if that's the case, but if what how Matt was saying, like, you know, if you drink a lot of coffee, you generally upregulate those liver enzymes, you know, like the CYP1 oh, yeah. or two. And, melat- you know, so we've talked about that caffeine is a substrate for this enzyme, but melatonin is as well. So theoretically, if you drink coffee, um, it will increase the breakdown of melatonin, but then you sit with a whole bunch of paras. Um, you know, parazanthine, yeah. uh, which then creates an overstimulating effect. So that could be another way how it's kind of interfering with the natural, you know, yeah. sleep cycles and circadian rhythms. So we've talked about a lot of the stimulation of coffee into the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system through all the different derivatives, and we mentioned it does it by initiating a calcium a channel or a calcium influx through these calcium channels. So for anyone that's interested about taurine and magnesium. 
the why mm. they're so important in the body and when we're controlling these GABA receptors and all these off and on switches the calcium will keep rushing in until magnesium comes and blocks the channel and what reinforces the magnesium block in the channel is taurine mm. so if you've got a taurine deficiency then your magnesium doesn't work properly as a block mm. so what that means is so calcium goes in and in until they their positive and negative chain charges on the inside and outside of the cells flip or something and then that causes magnesium to rush towards these gates and it kind of sits in these gates and then by sitting there the calcium can't come in well taurine holds it there effectively so um, taurine deficiency can often lead to inactive magnesium or magnesium deficiencies or an inability to control your calcium channels Mm. so a magnesium and a taurine deficiency would also make your make it really harder to get your circadian rhythm and your sleep wake cycles going properly um, especially in coffee drinkers and excessive coffee use combined with the diuresis and that constant calcium channel activation could actually be a legitimate cause for both magnesium and taurine deficiency. Yeah. And if you're yeah. vegan, you'll be getting plenty of magnesium because that's in the chlorophyll or the green leafy stuff, but not enough taurine wow. to help that magnesium work properly. It's funny because um, as far as a, a, a podcast I'd like to do, um, it's funny, I always notice stuff moves in balance and counterbalance if the pendulum swings one way yeah. it's like okay kids were too hardly you know they were disciplined and you know it's all horrible and now they're not disciplined at all and like you know teachers had all the authority and now they've got you know what i mean like yeah. everything seems to move like at the moment you're seeing a counter uh, trend to the veganism movement with the rise of the carnival yes which that's is the really thing. really interesting yes. it's like well, it's almost like a protest it's like well screw you vegans i'm right. not happy yeah. with your protest and all the rest that's of it so omnivores are eat. just stuck in the middle i know, I right? know. but um, what's this, funny though is that matt that. and i were watching a um uh, a documentary on the plane called fat and it talked about the guy in the 19 is it 1920s 19 I don't know yeah it was it was sort of around that time around mm-hmm. the first world like war and and he went to and lived with the Inuits and just basically ate seal blubber and and caribou and but did and you have you seen the game changes yet did no I haven't, I haven't watched just it just watch it but the funny thing is it's the same story they, they, both of they're those just, they're both exactly the same story substituted and then plans. Did one of the guy it's fat and it's got to be animal fat is the key and the other one and says it uses all the same information and data and the other ones it's got to be plant yeah right and it's and it's like almost exact you couldn't have a more opposite but they've basically used a similar data over the same time period and just spun it towards their it story is, it's funny how people t- play with data because i mean i was listening to the radio yesterday and they had a whole thing our oh, latest research has come out that fiber increases blood sugar what yeah what? I was like, so like we have to rethink the way we eat, and I'm like, no, mm. media like, would love that what? because we all did it. We went, it's just, what? Con- what? It's just what? controversial, and that's what it's they want. It right? doesn't matter yeah. if it's true. And as Winston Churchill said, like yeah. it's halfway yeah. around the world. And the problem is now more than anything, more than anything, and we've seen it with bozos in our industry seriously i'd love to smack upside the head is that they manipulate through social media the fact that people have a two second attention yeah. span. Yeah. They yeah. read the first line. I've read it. It's yeah. fact. Yeah. First, yes. you know that yeah. first. Yeah. You know yes. where yeah. go first. One. So anyway, well. So to summarise. <laughs> well, I to can't sum- fuck it. Well. To summarise it, they're basically coffee's not so bad. It's better if it's in its natural form, as always. Yep. It's follow the laws of nature. Don't go get the pure stuff. Um, also look at the synergies between them. Stacking it with other forms of caffeine. I, I think that, as usual, multiple forms of caffeine are better. So it's stacking through with the, you know, stacking the yerba mates and the green coffees and you can stack the guaranas and you can combine them all. They all have totally different effects. They also have a different um, pharmacokinetic pathway. So that way we can range, we can start feeling the effects at half an hour. We can then delay the release of more for about an hour we can actually get this nice two to three hour period of good levels of arousal in the brain as well as the peripheral um, effects of caffeine to support your performance goals whatever they may may be Um, whether you're just going for fatty acid oxidation or whether you're an elite athlete looking for your extra four seconds um, it's actually quite safe in these sort of reasonable doses just don't do the pure stuff um, mm. well, and, 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 and also when you look at the, the formulated RTDs and you look at a lot of those formulated ones, they're just used in the synthetic forms of caffeine and they don't have any of that 
herbal matrix around it. You know that the, the crude herbs of you know, polyphenols and yeah. other bits and pieces and fibres that have all those other effects. Well, what fascinated me, Matt, was obviously the introduction of caffeine for steady state. I can kind of see now where that could be a massive benefit. So yeah. if, if you're into steady state or if you like it or if you prefer it, whatever it is, maybe consider taking you know a, a caffeine supplement or a cup of coffee before you go for your walk. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, that's the, what the studies show. It's actually pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. What it doesn't show, which bugged me because I thought it would, you know, yeah, the old stories. You know, so naturopath story with coffee was that, you know, through the European cultures and that sort of stuff, they would have coffee after meals because it helps the bile flow. Um, yeah, and that yeah. helps to emulsify and break down the rich desserts. And that's why, and it's very, got the bitter principles to aid digestion. So I had a look at that. It actually, there's a fair bit of study shown it does help flow of bile through the liver, but does absolutely nothing to support the gallbladder and potentially makes yeah. the gallbladder worse. I can't see, I can't yeah. see how that would be benefit the gallbladder I mean but you know but it probably just does the liver stuff up regulating that I'd the say it's the bitter, the the bitter taste because all bitter tastes kind of like you know stimulate digestion yeah. well it definitely um, helps with uh, your morning constitutional as they say yeah. I mean like definitely What's that mean? Um, going to the toilet for number two a number yes. two number that's two. why they use it in enemas as well you know the the coffee enemas what is like with that. coffee yeah. enemas well i think it's because it uh, well it absorbs ex- apparently really well rectally yeah, um, yeah. And but they don't do coffee enemas to wake you, up, do they? No, 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 no. So it's what, like what they morning. mainly use it for? If someone came to because the coffee <laughs> machine's broken at the moment, the and morning. I want to know why. <laughs> someone comes in with a with a hose. I'm like, I'm straight out of bed. Yeah. No, the reason why they do it is the enhanced absorption, and because Imagine they're doing that. Imagine frothing your milk. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <Sorry. laughs> and because they One do lump it. One two. <laughs> They do it for detoxification purposes. Because look, when they do enemas when they detox anyway. But glutathione is actually a great, glu- uh, oh, sorry, caffeine is a great glutathione enhancer. So it enhances glutathione. So they use it for the overall detoxification, you know, enema, bowel detoxification, glutathione mm-hmm. enhancement. That's what they do. I mean, I've never done it and I'm not keen to ever so do something. So you've never done an enema? No. No. I chickened out. I, I went. I went and the chick was really hot and it totally, <laughs> like I went there and I was like, because we just studied, you know, when you're a naturopath, everything you read, you think I need this, I, yes, I need it. Yes. So we did this big stuff about colonic and I got burned in my class big time because I just asked the question, like, how is this natural? Like where well, in nature, ancient, do you, like where in nature are we getting this thing to happen? Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, so anyway, coffee enemas, we were talking about that. So you have one in the mornings. No, I don't personally have <laughs> no, one. <sorry. laughs> but yes, that's generally what people will do. Is they, if they detox, they would have one in the morning. A coffee? Yeah. Every morning? Up the day? A coffee enema. Every day? Well, no, no, not every day. Well, I don't know. Some people may do it every day, but I don't think that's healthy, to be no, quite honest. No, I don't honest. think so. And I don't think I it's still, You still can't convince me. I mean, like, I'm not saying... We're not I, trying I to no, convince I'm, you. I'm just saying what people do. Well, I'm not here to tell people to do it. Right. Yeah, because yeah. I went to this... It was in Brisbane somewhere. It was like... And I did this thing. I did this course, and it sounded like a great idea. And then I went there. I was chickening out a little bit beforehand because you've got to kind of wait in the garage for the finish that last the neck of the person before. <laughs> in the garage. And the person came out looking very pale. <laughs> Maybe they're full of shit. <laughs> but, Maybe they um, weren't anymore. Yeah, that's right. That's why they're a pile. Yeah. Um, so then, um, yeah, and then I got in there talking about it and showed me the machinery and stuff, and I was just like, oh. Uh, but it's, it's not I just one of those things out. where I just go, and I appreciate the people that do. You know, I'd love someone to shove something up my bum. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I know. why don't you come over and let's have an enema party? I mean, see, those are things that don't go together. Let's. You know, no, we could start that. I tell you what, <laughs> you, you're, you're probably one of the best business people I know. Like you got this ability to kind of inspire people. Right. I reckon you could do it. What? So thanks, guys. Thank Any you, final Jeff. words on the caffeine? I mean, I'm going to take more. That's what I'm taking out of it. But the natural forms. No, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Good. Drink good quality coffee. Keep your, you know, servings under control, I guess. And, 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 and look for your natural forms. Go for <laughs> your right. yerbas. Go for your green teas. But go for coffee is good for you. Or caffeine right. is good for you. It's got in, lots of health benefits. In moderation, correct? In moderation. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, that's uh, it from us, and we'll be back next week <laughs> with some more. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, okay, ready? <clears throat> the child is here. I told you. Didn't I tell you? Everyone says, I know. Everyone thinks I'm the child.
but no, it's eight. <laughs> <laughs> Cut that bit out. <laughs> but, oh. <laughs> yeah, did you hear that? Oh, let me tell you, Jack. Oh no. Okay. Oh, all right. Sorry. <laughs> all right. No, I won't tell that, Jack.